So I would like to welcome everyone at the Susie Bayeri Lecture. Susie Bayeri played a central role in statistical science and served as a role model for many students and young researchers. She obtained her PhD in Valencia under the supervision of Jose Bernardo. After finishing her PhD, she became a faculty member and stayed in Valencia beside multiple research visits to US. She has written, yeah, she has written five books and nearly 70 articles with many prize winning ones. She has received various prizes and awards for her contribution to statistics. And she served also as a president of ISBA and other statistical societies. I didn't have the fortune of meeting her with her in person, but I've heard many people talking very highly of her research and her dedication of supporting junior researchers. The Susie Bayer Lecture was funded in 2016 and is delivered biennially at the ISBA World Meeting by a prominent young researcher under the age of 35. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce this year's Susie Bayer Lecturer, Pierre Jacob. Pierre has finished his PhD at Paris Dauphine under the supervision of Christian Robert. Then, after a few postdoc years in Singapore and Oxford, he became assistant and then associate professor at Harvard University. In 2021, uh, uh, he moved back to Paris as a full professor at ESSEC Business School. Pierre's research interests include, amongst others, time series analysis, state space models, and Markov chains. Despite his young age, he has already received several prestigious awards and prizes, including the Royal Statistical Society Guy Medal in Bronze, the David Picard Award for Teaching and Mentoring, and multiple prizes for his PhD thesis. Uh, he was and is supervising already seven PhD students and four postdocs. He also actively contributes to the society with serving in editorial board in the editorial board of the Journal of Computational and Graphical Statistics and organizing several workshops and conferences. Pierre, thank you again for accepting to deliver the Susie Bayer Lecture, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boton, for this kind introduction. And also, thank you to the Scientific Committee for, for um, inviting me to give this Suzy Bayeri lecture. And so I, um, I will talk about a topic, Bayesian inference with models made of modules, uh, on which uh, Suzy Bayeri herself made uh, pioneering contributions. Um, and so the, the, the lecture will start with um, a variety of examples where models are made of different components referred to as modules, and where we could do a joint Bayesian analysis of um, all the parameters in the, in the model, but we might also want to do something else to depart from the joint modeling approach, and in particular to, to cut the feedback of certain parts of the model onto other parts of the model. So to estimate certain parameters not using all the data necessarily. Uh, so this leads to the, the idea of cut posterior distributions or cut distributions. And in the last part of the talk, I will talk about the computations involved when cutting feedback. So we'll start with some uh, uh, very simple uh, examples. So uh, one of the simplest examples is given by this model, by uh, Ogul, Barber, and Sartor, 2013, feedback and modularization in Bayesian meta-analysis of tree traits affecting forest dynamics. So you see a bunch of uh, variables in nodes. It's, um, graphical representation of a, of a statistical model. And when you zoom in, you see that there are arrows between the nodes, but also those diode uh, symbols or valves. And so the diodes are those uh, arrows with a, a bar. And they represent the idea that the uncertainty might flow in a specific direction and not both ways, as would be usually the case in a, in a graphical model. And so really this lecture is about those diodes. What do they mean? and should we use them, and, and how. And so in fact, we will look at much simpler models made of two components. So the first module would have parameter theta1 and data y1. A bunch of examples are coming uh, very, very soon. Uh, we have a prior on the parameter and a likelihood relating y1 to theta1. And then theta1 is also the input of another model, model 2 with uh, parameters theta2, data y2. And there, the, the prior and or the likelihood are defined conditionally on theta1. Uh, 
or some transformation of theta one. And so if we put everything together, we have indeed a joint prior distribution on theta one and theta two. We have a likelihood uh, obtained by uh, taking the product of the likelihoods in the two models. And so we can, uh, of course, apply Bayes formula and obtain the posterior distribution of all parameters given all data. And, you know, of course, in, in many cases, that's what we, we would like to do, but it turns out that in, in many cases, people have been departing from this joint modeling approach for a variety of reasons. Uh, it could be computational, or it could be the suspicion that model misspecification in some parts of the model might negatively impact the estimation of parameters in other parts of the model. And so there are reasons to depart from the joint modeling approach, not only computationally, but really statistically. And so we'll look at, um, at, at why to, we might want to uh, follow such departures, and how, and, and when. And so really, a, 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 a milestone paper in, in this uh, area is a paper by Fel Liu, Suzy Bayari, and, and Jim uh, Berger, 2009, in Bayesian analysis, of course. Modularization in Bayesian analysis with emphasis on analysis of computer models. Um, and so one of the contributions in this article is really to, to, to take this problem of uh, modularization seriously and to introduce very pedagogical examples in which the, the, the issues are, are easier to understand than in the type of complex models that we've seen in, in meta-analysis or, or in computer models. And so here, for example, there's a very simple uh, setup where there's a location model where Y1 is observed. It's uh, located around theta1, so theta1 is the location parameter on which we can put a prior distribution. And we assume that we have an extra data set, Y2, that, we, that might be um, in huge volume, but we might suspect it to be biased. And so we model the location of Y2 as theta1, the location of Y1, plus theta2, the bias. Okay? And importantly, if we just looked at model 2, really what it says is that theta1 plus theta2 is the location of Y2. But in our mind, we would like theta1 to remain the location of Y1 and we would like theta2 to be the bias. But it's not clear from the likelihood in model 2 alone, right? And so then we might model the bias, so put a prior distribution on theta2. And um, uh, th there might be different scenarios. You might be interested in the estimation of theta1 and wonder whether the extra data is useful, uh, refines the estimation, or whether it's harmful, potentially, particularly if you are really misspecified in the modeling of the bias in the second data set. And if the, interest is, sorry, if, if the interest is in the bias, there are also different strategies. You could estimate the bias and the location jointly, but you could also do a two-step approach. We'll come back to that later, but essentially you could estimate theta one in the first model only, and then keep that fixed to estimate theta two, not updating the distribution of theta one. So that's a, that will lead to the cut distributions. So uh, a realistic example that's very similar to this uh, pedagogical example is provided by uh, uh, George Nicholson and, and colleagues in the UK. And they were working on interoperability of statistical models in pandemic preparedness. And uh, one of the examples is the estimation of prevalence of a certain uh, virus called SARS-CoV-2 in the UK. And they have good quality data in the form of uh, randomized surveillance data. So a sample of the population, the gener hopefully representative of the general population in the UK, is asked to test on a weekly basis. And out of this, there are positive tests and negative tests, and we can estimate the prevalence of the virus using, for example, a hypergeometric model. Um, and then we also have a lot of extra tests being done, for example, by patients with clinical need or health and care workers. Um, but this is not necessarily a population that's representative of the UK general population. And so in order to model um, those data, we involve the prevalence uh, pi of the, the virus in the general population, but also the probability of uh, testing given that the individual is infected, the probability of, of testing given that the individual is, is not uh, infected, which we don't have to do in the, in the first data set because we ask people to test uh, every week. And so again, the, if the interest is in estimating the prevalence, is it better to just use the good quality data or should we use this large opportunistic data? 
that we have with um, uh, those, those tests that are being performed in the, in the general population, uh, but possibly with a bias. And if the interest is, in, in fact, in the ascertainment bias, so if the interest is, in, for example, in the probability of testing given that individuals are infected, then we might again consider a joint model or a two-step approach where we first estimate the prevalence and then keep that fixed to estimate the other parameters in the second model. <coughs> so personally, I encountered those kind of questions in a, in a different setting in, um, while visiting Lawrence Murray at the end of my PhD. At the time, he was uh, at CSIRO in Australia and he was working with um, uh, scientists modeling plankton population dynamics. And so there, there was an input of the plankton population dynamic model that was the temperature of the ocean at certain locations and certain times. And, and to us, this was just a file with a, a certain number of temperatures with the associated times and locations. But in fact, it was not uh, an exact measurement. It was obtained from a geophysics model. And so we started wondering whether we should take into account the uncertainty that was probably at some point in those uh, temperatures. And, and conversely, if we were to be able to do a joint model, whether we would then learn more about the temperatures from the biological data, which is not considered very plausible by domain experts in, in that field. And of course, in, in this setup, it's also clear that there would be computational uh, obstacles in, in performing joint modeling, because typically both the geophysics model and the, the plankton population uh, dynamic models are very computationally expensive. And so imagining a joint model is uh, typically unrealistic. I'll go back to some of the computational aspects uh, as well. So a field where, so I'm listing uh, again a bunch of other applications in different domains. Hopefully, uh, at least some of them will uh, ring a bell to, to you um, if you're not uh, aware of this modularization um, question already. And so here, for example, in PKPD, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, the question of two-step versus joint modeling has been a recurring theme for uh, more than 20 years. So there's a paper by Bennett and Wakefield in 2001, or Lundbest, Spiegelhalter, Graham, and Neuen Schwander in 2009, where the first model here is the pharmacokinetics model that models the time course of drug absorption. So we extract for different individuals the concentration of the active component of a drug in the, in the system after a certain time, after the intake of the drug. And then we would like to relate this to the health outcome. So typically, ultimately, we're interested in knowing whether the drug works or how well it works. But we need to know the concentration of drug components first in order to assess um, the impact on the health outcome. Okay. So again, there might be questions of, uh, is it better to do joint modeling? And, and in fact, in this literature, it is quite common that people do not do joint modeling, even if they could computationally and instead uh, favor a two-step approach where they keep the pharmacokinetics parameters fixed. They do not update them in the light of the pharmacodynamics model. Sometimes uh, the arguments are that the pharmacodynamics are, um, the model is more speculative. And so we're, we're worried about the, the feedback that it could have on the PK parameters, which we might be happy about uh, when estimated on their own. So another very important paper in this uh, thread is the, the one by Martin Plummer, 2014, who, among other things, is the main developer of JAGS, and was looking at the, the functions in, in open bugs, wind bugs, presumably trying to, to, to see whether they should be re-implemented in, in JAGS. And it identified a huge issue in, in one of those um, uh, functions in, in, in wind bugs. Uh, so here I'll talk about an example that he proposed uh, to, to illustrate the, the, the setup and I will come back to the computational aspects later on. So the example that is um, presenting is an example of a model of HPV, human papillomavirus prevalence, estimated uh, from uh, large studies in, in a number of countries, 13, uh, 13 countries in this study. And then once we estimate the prevalence of HPV, we, we might want to know the impact of this prevalence on two cervical cancer occurrence. And so here, there's a Poisson regression model in the second stage, where you see that the, the, the regression has a, a, an intercept eta1 and a slope eta2. And the prevalence of the virus in country I is the explanatory variable in the regression. So when you look at the second model on its own here, 
estimating all the parameters would amount to estimating both the regression coefficients and the explanatory variable at the same time, and, and that, that's a bit chilling. That that's, should feel a little bit uncomfort uncomfortable. And even in terms of interpretation, we usually interpret regression parameters keeping the explanatory variables fixed, whereas here it would be in a joint model estimated together. And so uh, similar questions arise, of course, outside of the, the Bayesian uh, framework. So for example, there are very classical articles in uh, econometrics, such as Murphy and Topol uh, 1985. Usually it's referred to as two-step estimation. You, you, you have a, a first regression model. So in the case of Murphy and Topol, it was a, a, a regression of the proportional growth in the M1 definition of money on two lagged, um, lagged values of the, the same quantity and lagged unemployment. Out of this, we extract the residuals, and this is interpreted as the unanticipated money growth. And then we look at the impact of this unanticipated money growth onto unemployment in another regression model, where again, in the second stage, you might be interested in the coefficient gamma, and the explanatory variable associated with this is estimated from a first model. Sometimes it's also called a generated regressor, so it's more or less the, the same thing. So in the words of the author, joint estimation here is inappropriate or computationally infeasible. So those kind of questions are not unique to the, the Bayesian framework. So a, a bunch of other examples in, in missing data. Typically, you would have a, a, a model to impute missing values, and then you would do something with the completed data set. And then if everything is probabilistic, you could envision a joint modeling approach to both impute the data and infer all the parameters that you might like to do with the completed data. Uh, so there's a lot of articles, of course, on this. this. This one by Jackson, Best, and Richardson puts a particular emphasis on the question of joint estimation or, or modular. Uh, a very similar but slightly different setup is, um, has been investigated a lot by Shaoli Meng and, and colleagues like Alex Blocker. Multi-phase inference, and the problem there is explained as, as follows. You have a first group of analysts who pre-process uh, some data. Um, in some applications, the pre-processing is a huge endeavor, like in some astrophysics uh, application or in certain biological applications. And then an, another group of analysts, not necessarily the same people, um, use the processed data to answer some scientific questions of interest. And again, there would be the question of should we do a joint model that takes the pre-processing into account, as well as what we want to do with the processed data? Should we propagate the uncertainty in the pre-processing stage? Should we allow some feedback, and so on? Uh, last two, two examples. In environmental epidemiology, there are also uh, articles that put a, a strong emphasis on those kind of questions. For example, estimating environmental exposure, such as air pollution, and then estimating the impact of those um, exposures onto health outcomes. So this one by Blangiardo, Hansel, and Richardson is, is, um, is, a, is a great read on, on, on these kind of applications. And finally, causal inference with propensity scores, so that might be quite related to David Stevens' uh, talk two days ago. Um, in, in observational studies, we might estimate first the probability of individuals receiving a treatment, and then we might want to estimate the effect of the treatment using the outcome. Um, and we could do a joint model, but that would amount to somehow using the outcome in the imputation of the propensity scores, and that feels a bit also uncomfortable for some people in that field. Okay. So there, there are uh, very interesting articles by Corey Ziegler, and Francesca Dominici, colleagues, and, and David Stevens and colleagues on this. And so in the, an article with Lawrence Murray, Chris Holmes, and Christian Robert, uh, five years ago uh, on archive, we, we try to gather those examples to see the commonalities and, and, and try to see if there's um, a general strategies that can be recommended to, for example, decide whether to cut or to use the joint model. So we'll come back to one of the proposals we made in that paper uh, later on. Okay, so to summarize, we have a setup where model number two depends on an input that is itself estimated using model number one. We could do, in principle, a Bayesian analysis. And this obviously has some benefits of uh, using the standard Bayesian analysis. So everything we know about Bayesian analysis then straightforwardly applies. Of course, here I've mentioned only examples where the parameters are finite dimensional. But you could imagine similar questions in, 
infinite dimensional uh, cases, and I think Judith will mention uh, some of this in our discussion. Um, and so there are appeals, and, and by now also there is the appeal that uh, Bayesian analysis is, in a sense, finally uh, well accepted. We've heard that um, from uh, Adrian Rafteri's uh, talk that it's used in the UN and it's been approved by the FDA, and so th there's a cost in departing from something that is well understood. Uh, and in principle, there is a computational toolbox available. Like for example, if you can evaluate pointwise the priors and the likelihoods in both models, in principle, you can do MCMC to sample from the posterior distribution in the joint model. Uh, however, there are computational difficulties. So in particular, because difficulties will tend to pile up when you consider multiple models. So for example, if the first likelihood is multimodal and the second likelihood is intractable, then the joint model might have a, both a multimodal and intractable likelihood, which is so then potentially harder to tackle than either one of those problems uh, on, it, on their own. Uh, the parameters might be harder to interpret as their meaning can change across uh, modules. So we define theta one in the first module. And um, it's not clear, at least to me, whether the, the meaning of theta one uh, remains unchanged when we then use it as part of an encompassing model. And finally, uh, one of the most common arguments in uh, justifying departures from this joint modeling approach is the possibility of model misspecification in part of the models. And that means that sometimes doing the joint model is, is, is actually harmful, even if it was computationally feasible. And so what else can we do? Right, so maybe we want to do something else than the joint modeling approach. So what else can we do? And so I will uh, now explain this idea of cutting feedback using cut posterior distributions. <clears throat> so the simplest thing that we could do first would be a plug-in approach where we would estimate theta one using a point estimate for example, the posterior mean in the first model, and then keep that fixed when estimating theta two using the standard posterior distribution in the second model. So the obvious drawback here is that the uncertainty about theta one is not propagated onto the estimation of theta two, so which could be not a problem at all if this uncertainty was small in relative terms, but it could also be problematic. Um, on the other hand, we successfully prevented uh, any feedback from model two onto model one when we do this. So model one is estimated, the parameter theta one is estimated using only y one in model one. And so the cut posterior is um, achieving the goal of propagating uncertainty from model one to model two without allowing feedback from model two onto model one. And it's uh, achieving this using this cut distribution, which is a probability distribution on the joint parameter space, theta one, theta two. It depends on y one and y two, but it is not the posterior distribution in the joint model. It is defined as, for the marginal distribution on theta one, you plug the, the posterior distribution in the first model, here in blue, and then you plug as a conditional the distribution of theta two given theta one and y two, that is the standard posterior distribution in the second model. And this is not the standard Bayesian um, uh, approach because the marginal distribution of theta one in this approach only depends on y one, whereas in the case of joint modeling, it would also depend on the second model. So on y two, on the prior, on theta two, and so on. So this has many names, it could be called, uh, it's pretty much Bayesian version of what is called two-step estimation in econometrics. It's called cutting feedback, which uh, according to John T. Rougier on a comment uh, on Senso Forest and Sandeleski, of course in Bayesian analysis 2008, um, John T. suggests that, Nikki Best suggested that cutting feedback term. And so another view on this cut distribution is, is simply that this is the distribution that we would obtain if we could perfectly sample from the first posterior, obtain theta one, and then perfectly sample from the second posterior conditional on theta one. If we were to do this procedure, we would obtain a draw from the cut distribution. So there are various things that we can say about these this cut uh, distributions. I've tried to, uh, to aggregate uh, some of the results from the, the recent literature, but this explains first the, those diodes. Um, so when we see those diodes, it means that we are preventing feedback from part of the model onto others. Uh, according to the Openbugs manual, 2004, the cut function, so, which was a function of Openbugs, acts as a kind of valve in the graph. Uh, information is allowed to flow downwards, but not uh, is prevented to flow upwards. 
So when we look at the density functions of those distributions, we can highlight the differences. So the density function of the cut distribution, if we enroll the, um, the formulas, we get the first prior, P1 of theta 1, the first likelihood, the second prior, the second likelihood. But there's a division by the, the normalizing constant in the second application of base formula, which is not a constant with respect to theta 1, of course. And so as a result, the density of the cut is proportional to the density of the standard posterior, but divided by the so-called feedback term, uh, P2 of Y2 given theta 1, which integrates over uh, the values of theta 2. So it's the normalizing constant in the second model, in the, in the posterior distribution in the second model. This typically is intractable, and that will cause some headaches uh, later on when we talk about computation. And finally, another way of uh, re-expressing the, the same thing is that the marginal distribution of theta 1 differs when we cut, but the conditional distribution of theta 2 given theta 1 is in fact the same. So really the only difference is in the marginal distribution on theta 1. And there's this interesting result in U, Knott, and Smith on variational inference for cutting feedback in misspecified models, where they, um, it's, a, it's a variational representation of the cut distribution. It minimizes the cool black light blur divergence to the standard posterior, but constraining the first marginal to be uh, the posterior in the first model. So among all distributions that have that marginal for theta 1, the cut posterior is the closest to the standard posterior. So it's the, the minimal modification of it that achieves this marginal constraint. And so there are other arguments. I'm going to list them because, of course, then we'll do a, pro, a pros and cons type of list to see uh, if we'd like to cut or not. And so another argument that has been advanced to justify the cut distribution is that it could be a valid representation of beliefs about the parameters. And uh, here I'll introduce very quickly the, the framework of Bissiri, Holmes, and Walker 2016. Uh, if we have the prior beliefs on the parameters in the form of P of theta, and we have a loss function that involves some data and, and the parameter, and we assume the loss and the prior constitute independent pieces of information, which is going to be an important point, uh, we look for an update of our belief that we take into account the loss and also the prior. And we pretend at this point that we don't know that we, we're going to be Bayesian about it, so we just want to update somehow. And then we put some conditions on what this update should satisfy. And for example, we say that we would like order coherence, meaning that if we have a first piece of data Y and then a second piece of data Y prime, we would like the update using first Y and then Y prime to coincide with a single update that would use the additive loss associated with y prime and y. Okay, so that's something that we might want this update to, to satisfy. And then we also might want the update to be uh, optimal in a certain von Neumann and Morgenstern 1944 sense that I do not understand. But I think Chris Holmes is in the audience, and, and maybe uh, Stephen Walker might be around. So you can ask. Um, but if we put those conditions, then effectively we obtain the posterior distribution or the so-called Gibbs posterior or gen generalized Bayesian uh, posterior distribution as the solution of this update. And so we retrieve base if the, the loss is minus the log likelihood, otherwise we get maybe something else, but that looks like a Bayesian uh, posterior distribution. And so there's an interesting comment in Carmona and Nichols 2020 that we can retrieve the cut distribution in that framework, so in, in the framework that justifies uh, the update of beliefs on parameters, if we con consider the loss function to be minus the log likelihood in the joint model, so that's um, the first term here, but then we subtract the influence um, of the second model onto the first, so we subtract this feedback term that we've seen before. And so that's a bit problematic because we, we would like to apply the, the framework of Bissiri, Holmes, and Walker to say that the loss is independent from the prior. But in fact, you might remember that in the feedback term, we're integrating over theta 2, and so we use the prior on theta 2 there. And so this is not quite satisfying the requirements. And then in this paper by Nichols, Carmona, and also Lee and Wu, um, they basically adjust the argument to still say that it's, uh, we, can, we can still think of the cut as a valid type of update. So I, I won't spend more, more, more time on this, but I invite you to check out those articles if, if those kind of arguments uh, uh, are important to, to you. 
So note that we, we don't have to cut the feedback completely. So there's an interesting um, variant where we cut the feedback only uh, partially. So we want to control the amount of feedback of the second model onto the first. So here are two, um, th those same two articles, in fact, pay uh, attention to this kind of procedure. And they introduce a parameter between uh, zero and one. And when it's a zero, we, we do not cut feedback. And when it's one, we cut feedback completely. And in between, there's an interpolation. And there's also variants where we replace the log likelihood by other utility functions. And that's explored in the work of uh, David uh, Frazier and, and David Knott, um, uh, just uh, um, recently appeared on, on archive. So we can also talk about the asymptotic properties of this distribution on the parameter space. And uh, we've attempted to do a little bit of this with Emilia Pompe, uh, following uh, the, the analysis of Murphy and Topol on two-step estimators but taking into account the prior distributions, essentially. And so there are interesting choices that have to be made when we talk about asymptotics for this modular setup. For example, it's not clear whether we would like the data sizes to grow at the same rate or at different rates in different parts of the model. So we do the simplest thing in this paper, but I'm sure there's a, a lot of other things to do, especially if we think about a data set that would be good quality data and a data set that would be poor quality data. Probably we want to model their asymptotics with different uh, uh, speed of, um, of accumulation of data. But here, in our scenario A, we say basically that N1 and N2 are linearly related, and we assume that everything factorizes. So this is the, the data generating distribution that we assume factorizes. We have independent observations for both models. And we consider another scenario where, in fact, Y1 and Y2 refer to the same units or the same individuals. So we do not want to assume independence between Y1 and Y2. We do assume for simplicity independence between the different units. And so this would be, for example, the case where you do uh, multiple imputation. So on, on the different rows of your data, you want to impute the data. And then you do the analysis of the same rows. And so it's the same data that you're really using for both the imputation and the analysis, essentially. Or at least they're correlated. And so here we do not assume that um, uh, for unit i, the distribution of y1 and y2 are independent. So th those are just two scenarios among probably uh, many. Uh, then under classical regularity conditions, we can introduce and study the behavior of the two-step MLEs where we estimate the maximum likelihood um, uh, estimator in the first model that might converge to theta one star. And then conditional on theta one hat, we maximize the likelihood of the second model that might converge to theta two star. And jointly, there might be asymptotic normality with a, a covariance uh, in the limit that will depend on the scenario. I'm not giving you the formulas. They're a bit uh, cumbersome, but essentially they involve terms that look like the sandwich formula. Of course, it's important to take misspecification into account here because that's a huge reason to depart from the joint modeling approach. So we have to study this uh, under the assumption of misspecification. And then, uh, of course, the variance of the score is not the Fisher information, and so things do not cancel out. So we have terms that look like sandwich formula, but with uh, derivatives of the two likelihoods with respect to the two different parameters and some cross derivatives. And then if we look at the cut distribution, we obtain also a sort of Bernstein von Mises theorem when centering the cut at the two-step MLEs. And then the asymptotic variance, unfortunately, does not match either um, the asymptotic variance of the MLE in scenario A or B, for one reason being, um, again, the mismatch between Fisher information matrices and sandwich covariance matrices. And so that means that the credible regions obtained with the cut distribution will not have directly good properties in terms of uh, calibration, uh, coverage. But of course, if we understand all of those uh, covariance matrices, we can adjust, we can fix this. Another aspect of the asymptotics is, is um, explored in Frazier and Knott, where they looked specifically at the asymptotics of the second posterior given theta one, when theta one is in, is in the vicinity of the limit of the MLE. And then they obtain um, an asymptotic distribution, which is again normal, but with a mean and a variance that do depend on theta one. And that's perhaps more interesting to understand the impact of the uncertainty about theta one and how it propagates onto the uncertainty about theta two. So there are exciting works on uh, the asymptotics of, of uh, cut posterior distributions, which are in the making, which have appeared really recently.
So to, to summarize, at this point, we have this uh, alternative to the uh, standard Bayesian analysis in the joint model. Using the cut distribution, we can mitigate the effect of misspecification. We can facilitate interoperability between different teams. There are scenarios where it's not necessarily the same people who have access to all the data, and so joint inference would be impossible just for, for privacy reasons, for example, or again, for computational reasons, which could be um, uh, solved by those kind of modular strategies, such as uh, implemented by the cut. It can resolve some computational intractability by, by, by segmenting the computation model-wise. We'll see that there are caveats. And uh, even though we are still in the middle of exploring the properties of such distributions, and most of what has been done so far is really on simple parametric models, so there's a, a lot of different things to consider, but it's not completely unprincipled. We can study those distributions, we can justify them using uh, update of belief type of arguments. So we're not in a completely uh, unknown territory either. Now, of course, there are uh, disadvantages as well. Of course, um, if the joint model was well specified and tractable, we should probably still use that, right? So otherwise we might lead to suboptimal estimation accuracy or, or prediction accuracy. Uh, by, by no means is the, the, the idea of cutting feedback a replacement or an alternative to trying to improve the models. Right? Of course, all of this is based on models which should be as, as, you know, as best as we can make them. Um, and of course, the, the, as we will see um, in the last part of the talk, the, the computation associated with cutting feedback, and as identified by, by Martin Plummers and, and others since, present their own challenges. So it's not necessarily that simple, in fact, computationally to cut feedback. And so th those lists of pros and cons can help maybe decide whether to cut or not, but we can also wonder whether you can use the data to, to help you decide. And so that's one of the proposals that we were uh, making in, in this, um, in this um, technical report, trying to be principled about choosing whether to cut or not, trying to phrase it as a, as a decision problem, and an obvious route was to use predictive performance. Okay, so we, we can, because we can evaluate that concretely on data, maybe using cross-validation or held out data, so we can see what distributions on the parameters lead to the best performing predictive distributions. But it's not that easy either, because what are we trying to predict? Are we trying to predict Y1, Y2, or both? And what should we use? What data should we try to predict when it, it comes to the selection of the cut or the joint uh, modeling approach? And so here we, we, we have just a claim, a postulate, that parameters are, are assigned a meaning in the module that defines them first. And so we should be happy with a distribution of parameters if it leads to a good prediction in the model that defines the parameters. Okay, that's a postulate. So concretely, what it means is that in the first model, for example, theta1 is introduced in its relationship with y1. So for example, it's the the prevalence of uh, a virus in the general population, or it's the location of um, uh, data points Y1. We would like to compare different distribution on theta1, the, the marginal obtained from the joint model approach, or the first posterior on its own. And we postulate that we should use the predictive performance with respect to Y1, because that's what gives a meaning to theta1. And so then we end up comparing upon using the frequential approach and, and the logarithmic scoring rule, the, the, the evidence in the first posterior with the conditional evidence of Y1 given Y2 in the joint model. So those are comparable quantities. They are both likelihoods of Y1, so comparable type of uh, quantities. And we would then say that if the marginal likelihood in the first posterior, in the first model, is higher than the conditional likelihood using Y2, that means basically using Y2 doesn't help in predicting Y1. And so then we say that we should use a marginal distribution equal to the first posterior. And then we have the problem of choosing the conditional of theta2 given theta1. But really, uh, I insist on the fact that our postulate is that we propose to follow this even if the interest is ultimately in predicting Y2 or in estimating theta2. We say that you would be happy with a distribution on theta1 if it's good at predicting Y1. And um, at least when we tried uh, numerically on, on different examples that were reported in the literature, like in uh, the paper by uh, Jim and Suzy Bayari and, and Fei Liu and all the paper by Martin Plummer, we find that in, with this plan of action, we retrieved uh, the same decisions to cut 
or to not cut, at least in some uh, simple examples. I should also mention at this point that in the variant where we modulate the amount of feedback, so we have a parameter between 0 and 1 that tells us how much feedback we allow from model 2 to model 1, then we don't have to choose whether to cut or not. We, we have to select that parameter. So maybe it's a, it's a better form formalism to actually think about those, those, um, those questions. Okay, and in the last part of the talk, I will, talk, uh, I will, um, uh, I will focus on computational aspects. Computational aspects when cutting feedback. And so there's a lot of confusion on this. So as an illustration, I took an ex excerpt from Andrew Gelman's uh, you know, f very famous blog. And in particular, there's a post entitled How to Cut Using Stan If You Must. And so Stan is a, is a software, a bit like Winbugs or, or Jags. So you code a model, and it does the MCMC for you, es essentially. And one of the questions, uh, slightly rephrased, was have cut posteriors been implemented in Stan? Presumably because it was implemented in OpenBug, so why not, why not in Stan? And the reply was uh, the following. The topic has come up before. I don't think this cut is a good idea. If you want to implement it, you'd first fit model one and get posterior simulations. Then approximate those simulations by a mixture of multivariate normal or T distributions. And then use that as a prior for model two. So actually, this is not uh, approximating the cut distribution. So this is a two-step approach to approximating the standard posterior distribution. So why is that? Because if we think of this mixture of multivariate normal fit calibrated on the first samples as a prior, and then we apply the Bayesian machinery, we're going to update this prior. So there will be feedback. But when we cut, uh, we, we, don't, we do not want that feedback. So it's, it's an easily, uh, easily made mistake, but I think there's a lot of confusion on this. And indeed, there's a lot of interest in modular approaches to estimating the standard posteriors. So for example, Loon, Barrett, Sweeting, and Thompson, uh, fully Bayesian hierarchical modeling in two stages, where the calculation is decentralized, the calculation is modularized, but the goal is to obtain the, the same posterior that you would have if you could fit the joint model. And likewise, in, in articles by uh, uh, Rob Goody at, and colleagues at, at Cambridge, um, th there, there are those questions of if you have multiple models, maybe it's hard to computationally do the joint model, or maybe there are conflicting information about some shared parameters. How do you resolve that to arrive at what you would have arrived if you were a super Bayesian with access to everything? So this is not about cutting feedback. And also in terms of non-computational aspects of this question, there's this interesting work by Leonelli, Barons, and Smith. On, on the problem of if you have different panels of experts, each having access to different part of the data, different part of the model, uh, what kind of rules should they follow so that they would jointly arrive at the same conclusion as a supra Bayesian without having access, each of them, to uh, everything? So this is a very interesting question, but this is not about cutting feedback. So when we think about cutting feedback, again, in terms of the, the density of the cut distribution, we have this a joint distribution on theta 1 and theta 2. And it's not tractable because uh, even if the full posterior density was tractable, there is this denominator which involves theta 1, so it's not a constant. And typically that's an integral with respect to theta 2. Unless you're in a conjugate case, you, you don't have access to exact evaluation of this, this feedback term. And so it looks like a doubly intractable pro program, a problem. And indeed, there are specialized MCMC algorithms that have been proposed for this. And this was explored in the context of uh, cut, cut posteriors by Liu and Goody in 2021. They use a, a stochastic approximation MCMC algorithm from uh, Feng Liang and colleagues proposed for Dublin tractable targets. So let's look at the, 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 the very interesting point made by Martin Plummer in 2014, which identifies that what was implemented in open bugs was, in fact, uh, not what was intended, or was not achieving uh, the results that were intended. So as you might know, open bugs and JAGs, they, they rely on Gibbs sampling. And in Gibbs sampling, you sample alternatively from the conditional distributions of parameters given other parameters. And you do uh, many sweeps. And, and hopefully that converges to your target. And so to cut feedback, the proposal there was to sample theta 1 using an MCMC algorithm that targets the first posterior, 
So removing all the terms that involve theta2 or y2 from the, the target of the update of theta1, but then still using theta1 when updating theta2, targeting at every step a different distribution, the posterior distribution given the current value of theta1. And that sounds quite reasonable, but in fact, this is not generating a Markov chain that admits the cut distribution as an invariant distribution. In fact, it's quite complicated to understand the limit of this. It depends on, for example, the proposal distribution within those kernels K1 and K2, and so you don't want to, to, be, uh, to have to interpret the results of that. And so sometimes this is called um, implicitly cut approaches because it's the algorithm that cuts feedback, but I would argue against, or I think Martin Plummer is pretty clear also in recommending against the use of such, uh, such, uh, such uh, algorithms. And the problem also, I guess, is that there are no easy fix that we know of. And so, again, in a perfect sampling world, in a, in a coupling from the past, rejection sampling, inverse CDF transform world, we would simply sample theta1 from the first posterior, and then we would sample theta2 given theta1 from the second posterior, and the job would be done. We would have samples from the cut. But of course, as you know, in many cases, we have to rely to non-exact sampling, such as Markov chain Monte Carlo, and so, the, the very naive MCMC approach to this problem would be to sample theta1 using a lot of steps of MCMC targeting the first posterior, and then given theta1, doing enough MCMC steps targeting the posterior of the second parameter given theta1. And of course, we have the issue of um, having this double asymptotic justification. So the, the samples that we would obtain would be valid when all the numbers of iterations involved in this procedure go to infinity which is not very convenient uh, to use. So for example, if you have a certain uh, result and you want a better result, you have to decide whether you want more theta ones or longer chains for theta two given theta one. And part of the difficulty is that the target distribution at the second stage depends on theta one. So every time you have a new theta one, in principle, you have a new target. So you might need to retune your algorithm, rerun diagnostics of convergence and so on and so forth. So it's not the, the most convenient strategy to use. Although in, in many cases, it could work really well, of course. And so we have a proposal with uh, John O'Leary and uh, Eva Chade coming from this work on, on couplings of Markov chains and to generate unbiased estimators with respect of, of expectation with respect to target distributions of interest. And I'm not going to delve into much details here, but we assume here that we know how to generate pairs of chains such that the chains meet at a random time called the meeting time which will be different every time you run the pair of chains, and meet in the sense that xt, the first chain at time t, becomes equal to yt minus l with a lag l, y being the second chain, and then the chains remain the same from that point onwards. So you see what happens at this meeting time here on this graph, is that the chains are the same but with a horizontal shift. So if I, if I shift the blue curve, it matches exactly the, the black curve. So it's not necessarily obvious how to generate Markov chains that, that couple in that way. Um, it's kind of an algorithmic, algorithmic specific uh, work, and, but um, people have been you know, looking at this problem and now we, we have some ideas on how to do it for random walk, uh, Metropolis, Rosenbluth, Taylor, Hastings algorithms, or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, or Gibbs samplers, pseudo marginal methods, and of, and of course there are many algorithms which we, uh, which, for which we don't exactly know yet uh, how to couple them or whether it's possible, but at least it's possible for some techniques. And so if we can do that, then it turns out that we can construct a sign measure, pi hat, on the parameter space, uh, const which is constituted from atoms on the parameter space and weights that can be negative, and there's a random number of atoms. And this is generated, we imagine, on, on different machines independently, many, many times. And then we aggregate those sign measures by a simple averaging uh, once we collect all the results, and we get consistency with respect to expectations of interest because each of those sign measures is unbiased. So then it's very easy to, to construct confidence interval using the CLT for IID random variables. So it's a, originally, primarily the motivation was to parallelize computation and get rid of the, the burn-in uh, problem, but it turns out that it's quite useful in the context of cut distributions because the unbiased property plays really well with the law of total expectation or the tower property. And so we're able to obtain unbiased estimators of expectation with respect to the cut distribution. 
And so in an unbiased MCMC world, so assuming that we know how to do those couplings of Markov chains, of the, of the MCMC algorithms that we would like to employ for both stages, we would obtain a signed measure for the first posterior, and then we could randomly select one of the atoms and run a couple chains conditionally on that uh, theta one until they meet, and we obtain a non-biased sign measure for the second posterior, and by the law of total expectation, uh, we can see that combining those two sign measures, we get an unbiased estimate with respect to expectation uh, of pi cut, the cut distribution, which means that then we can do lots of them in parallel and have consistency in a unique asymptotic regime of the number of parallel replications going to infinity. So it's parallel friendly, it's easy to compute confidence intervals, just for, I'm talking about the Monte Carlo error here. Okay, so this is an approach that is, uh, of course, not as good as if we were able to do perfect sampling. And, but in the meantime, there seems to be cases where we know how to do unbiased MCMC and we still don't know how to do perfect sampling. So there seems to be a room for this kind of techniques. And then outside of MCMC, uh, there's also variational inference approaches that have been developed recently for cutting feedback. Uh, in particular, the work of Yu, Not and Smith. Uh, that was presented yesterday, um, where they use mean field approximation and message passing. Turns out it's really uh, amenable to cutting feedback. Essentially, what is not valid to do in the case of Gibbs sampling becomes valid to do in the case of message passing variation and inference, where you can just drop terms in the factor graph. And then there's uh, another approach uh, by Carmona and Nichols based on uh, normalizing flows, not based on mean field inference. And with Emilia Pompey, we looked at posterior bootstrap. So very quickly, posterior bootstrap is the idea of randomizing the data and then computing the MLE or computing the, the map in the first model. And then given the estimate, randomizing the second stage data, computing the MLE or computing the map, and obtaining then a, a pair of samples, theta one hat, theta two hat. And we looked at the asymptotics of such procedures. And in fact, they do not retrieve the cut. They retrieve the distributions of the two-step MLEs. So the variance there is, in fact, uh, involving the sandwich formula. And so, in a sense, it's not the cut. It's not a way of approximating the cut directly, but it's a way of obtaining credible regions that have the right coverage uh, properties. And, uh, but algorithmically, it's, it's a straightforward application of the earlier work of uh, Newton and Raftery, and then much more recently, uh, multiple articles by Fong, Lydon, Holmes, and, and Walker. And finally, in the context of intractable likelihoods, where we can't do also exact MCMC algorithms, this recent work by Chakra Borti, Not, Droven, D, Frazier, and Sisson considers cutting feedback in uh, an ABC type of setting. Okay, so I'm reaching uh, the, the end of this lecture. So to, to wrap up, the, the, the appealing, one of the appealing aspects of Bayesian analysis is its unified treatment of, of many different statistical questions. I believe that's what brought us to this kind of paradigm in, in the first place, you know, going away from the list of the catalog of different statistical techniques and having a coherent framework that you know, finally makes sense and relates different problems like hypothesis testing, prediction, parameter estimation, and so on. Um, and so modular approaches seem to depart from something that is nice and comfortable, and so it brings discomfort. And thus I anticipate that I maybe brought discomfort, and so I, I'm sorry, I hope you're okay, but we're reaching the end anyway. But echoing the discussion of, of David Stevens uh, two days ago, the essence of Bayesian analysis maybe is not the direct application of Bayes formula. It's probability distributions on the quantities of interest that leverage prior information is, if uh, available, um, using the data, of course, but also a framework that has uh, some principles that justify it, whether you're, you're personally more convinced about asymptotic properties or about those kind of validity of updates of belief uh, in a more decision theoretical framework, this can also put potentially apply to modular inference. And if you're just looking for a good excuse to play with Markov chains, you can also do that with modular inference. And so then cut posteriors might be essentially uh, Bayesian methods too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre, for the great talk. Uh, the Q&A is postponed uh, to the end of the uh, session. So next, uh, two well-known word experts will discuss Pierre's uh, presentation. First, Professor Judith Rousseau.
from uh, University of Oxford and Paris Dauphine. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So I'd like to thank the uh, scientific committee for inviting me for giving a discussion. It's a real pleasure for first discussing Pierre's work because it's always very exciting. And uh, second, for being a, a discussion in Cizy Bayer's rec lecture because she was a great person and a great statistician, so she was a role def definitely a role model there. Uh, so how did it work? Yeah, it's a bit of a mess, my slide, I'm sorry. So. Um, <laughs> just to make you feel comfortable after Pierre's talk, I guess. Um, so just to summarize what he does, uh, what, he was being, what he was presenting, so the story is cut posterior. So you have, y, you have two data sets, say, Y1 and Y2, and then you have the first data set that depends on theta1. You put a prior on theta1 and you get a posterior. You could do that. You have a second data set, Y2, and you have two parameters, theta1 and theta2. And then you have a model and you put a prior on theta 2 given theta 1. So if you're fully Bayesian, then you, you multiply everything. That's my pi, fa, pi full story. And uh, you've got this horrible formula, but you have a joint distribution on theta 1 and theta 2. But as Pierre has been uh, explaining, you might not want to do that. And what he proposes instead is to use this cut posterior because you don't want feedback. And so you have a formula which is almost the same, but not quite. And um, do I have a pointer? Well, it doesn't really matter. Oops, that was the wrong idea. Okay. And so, uh, and so what you get is essentially is almost the same, but you have this sort of uh, unpleasant normalizing constant be 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 below m of y2 given theta1, which says, which says that you do something else. But the aim of the game was to do something else, so it doesn't really matter. But just as a point, uh, so if you look at the sort of the formula p pi full divided by m2, which sort of makes the difference between the full and the, and the cut posterior, you can think, ah, oh, why? So it's, it's, a, it's as if I was using a data-dependent prior, because uh, pi 1 of theta 1 given y1, y1 divided by m2 of y2 given theta 1. You can think about it as a, a data-dependent prior, but it's not a very exciting way of thinking about it, I think, because the data-dependent prior that it implies is totally ridiculous. So I don't think that's the right way of thinking about it. Uh, but they don't think about it that way, don't worry. Uh, so the questions he, he tried to answer was why and when and, and how. So I'll just first talk about why and when uh, you, you want to use that. Essentially, you have sort of these two sort of categories. One is because you have a two-stage procedure. Uh, so essentially, you have some sort of uh, fast trick for the first stage, and then you want to not uh, bother too much into putting everyone together, and so you fix the first stage and you do the second stage. And so it can be, so it's, it can be computationally easy, or maybe because the data arrives like that, and uh, so that's one of the uh, way of thinking about it. The second, which is sort of the focus of their concern, is essentially robustness, because you might be not totally trustworthy in one of the modules and you don't want to, the second module to pollute the first and so you want to cut feedback. feedback. And so their big question was, can you do that in a principled manner? Uh, and can you find the implementation that's efficient? So that's tr what he tries to answer. So in Better Together, so that's that of their main paper, which was um, uh, also very inspiring for me afterwards and I'll go to that, to that later on. Um, they try to find this sort of justification and uh, one comment that they make, which is like an, a bit anecdotal but funny, is um, like if you are interested in prediction, so if you wanted to, pr to make prediction, and now forget about the cut posterior story, so you ha you f if you look at uh, the prior predictive, so you, which is this f pi thing, so you have one data y and you integrate out the, th the prior, the theta given using the prior, that would be something that, a priori, that doesn't sound very exciting as a, as a pr predictive version because you don't uh, use the data or anything. Um, compared to the posterior predictive where you would integrate theta using the posterior distribution. So if you do that, what you're targeting is this f y given theta star, where theta star is essentially the projection. 
Uh, like if you had a true data, if, a true, if the model was well specified, that would be the true value of the parameter. Otherwise, it's the projection of your P0 onto the, onto the model. So what they notice is that in some cases, F pi of Y is better than F theta star of Y. Uh, and then they say, ah, because it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's, this is the case for this simple case, it's, it's also that possibly the cut posterior is going to be better for prediction than the, the full posterior. I think it's very anecdotal in a sense. I'm not sure that I would use that as a guide in a sense because the pi that you have picked to make it better for F, that F pi is better than F theta star is just very, very specific. And by chance, you picked the right pi, but there was no reason that you picked that one, and blah, blah, blah. So, but, so if, it's, if they stop there, it wouldn't be very satisfying. But they do not stop there, and then they try to think of a way to actually decide whether uh, the cut is better than the not the cut by thinking in terms of prediction. And that's quite interesting. So if you wanted to do that in terms of prediction, what you would like to, to see is whether the kullback lebert divergence between P star, which would be your true predictive ver ver versus the uh, predictive associated to the cut or the predictive associated to the, to the full posterior, whether one is better than the other. The problem is that estimating this kullback lebert divergence is very complicated. And so what do you do? And then they propose working this sort of uh, score version. So, so they, they essentially, they try to do something around uh, looking at the sort of pr pr uh, predicting the next given the past, and then you average, you average over all these possibilities, and you get the base factor. So they use the marginals, essentially. So it, it boils down to using the marginals. So that's the natural way of thinking about it in a sense. So for me, so again, I guess I will, help, uh, I will uh, uh, annoy everyone in the room, but for, for, I'm not sure this is a predictive version of things. For me, the marginal is a fit, is a model fit measure. It's not a predictive measure. Like you are trying to see if the data that you have observed fit your model, you're not trying to see whether the next get data is going to be well predicted. And so I know, I know that not everybody's agreeing with me with that, but uh, that's just something I wanted to raise. Um, but still, this is a perfectly valid and interesting approach. So it would be really interesting to see whether if you did that, you could prove something. So can you prove that if one was better than the other in some sense, so you would have to figure out what would be the sense in which one would be better than the other in truth. If you use the base factor, sort of this sort of cut versus full, you would get the, the, the right decision asymptotically, or that would be my version of it, but or something else. So that's my first question, can you prove it? And do you want to prove it based on Y1? Do you want to prove it based on Y2, on the full? Lots of possibilities, and one may be easier than the other, I don't know. So now, as, um, uh, so the first time I heard about uh, these sort of problems from Pierre was in a Nisba meeting in, uh, what was it, uh, Sardinia, I think. So he presented this work, and I thought, wow, oh, it's so exciting, yes. And actually, a very nice framework where you could apply it is semi-parametric inference. And so that's my world, but I'm going to explain to you why I find it super exciting in this framework, or it might be super exciting in this framework, and you might disagree or not. And so this, some, what I mean by semi-parametric inference, so you have a model where theta is finite dimensional, and uh, you have some nuisance parameter, eta, which is typically infinite dimensional. It can be one function, many functions, doesn't matter. And uh, so you, if you're Bayesian, you put a prior on theta and eta, and then you have a full posterior distribution on theta and eta using the base formula. Uh, but the problem is, and I'll explain, I'll give you a few examples, or one actually. Uh, the problem is that in semi-parametric inference, it's very hard to be good for theta and eta. And I'm not the first one to say it in this conference. It's uh, very hard to find a prior that's good for everything. You're not going to be, if you put a prior and the, model, the, model, the parameter space is complex, you're not going to be good for everything. You have to sort of figure out what's your parameter of interest. But if you're interested in many different things, then you might want to do something modular, in a sense. And I'm going to sort of explain really what I want. So for instance, imagine that uh, you love asymptotics. I'm sure you do. And uh, so what you want to be good is you want to be good asymptotically for theta. For instance, you want to have a bunch of from Mrs. result for theta. 
And, but you also want to be good for ETA. So you want to have good contraction rates or maybe credible regions in, theta, in ETA that are good, well-behaved, and things like that. And that's difficult. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Well, how, the reason why it's difficult is, as far as we've seen so far in the literature, there is now quite a bit of work on Bernstein from Mises in semi-parametric models. Often, to get a Bernstein from Mises in semi-parametric model, you need to undersmooth eta, the prior on eta. What, what do I mean by that? I'm going to explain what I mean by that in, a, in an example. Where ima so you have a xi and xn that are Gaussian random variables, but they are dependent Gaussian random variables. I must imagine that they are stationary. And your covariance matrix then depends on the spectral density. And it's a long memory Gaussian process, which means that the spectral density explodes at zero at a certain rate. So uh, the, the um, spectral density f of x is like x to the power minus, minus theta 1 times h. So theta 1 is a long memory parameter. It's in between 0 and 1 half. And h is a short memory part of your spectral density, and it's a function, and it's well behaved. So you put a prior on theta 1 and a prior on h, and you, you recover the poster distribution. The thing is that, uh, and it's a, like a minimax re uh, uh, result, the estimation in theta 1 depends strongly on the properties of h. So the rate of estimation of theta 1 depends on the smoothness of the true h. And that's one problem. The second problem is that, so imagine you put a prior on h by you expand log h on the basis and you truncate your basis. And, the, and then if you sort of do the data dependent way, the truncation will sort of depend on the smoothness of h. Okay, imagine h is beta really smooth, doesn't matter what, beta, what it means. Essentially, if, uh, if you wanted to estimate theta 1, you would have to truncate at a level which is n to the power 1 over 2 beta. And if you wanted to estimate h, you would have to truncate at a level which is n to the power 1 over 2 beta plus 1. So there is a conflict. Because if you want to estimate theta 1, you do something else that if you want to estimate h properly. And it's very hard to find a prior that's going to be the two together. So that's sort of uh, what got me thinking into the cut posterior would be a great idea in semi-parametric inference. And I'm, we've, what we've done recently with, some, with a student of mine is actually to apply it in a context. So for the first one, we didn't apply it. But for the second one, we applied it. So it's a hidden Markov model. I'm not going to describe the story, just to say that it works. Uh, so it's, um, you have some data Y, so finite state, state space hidden Markov model. So the Y given the states has distribution F that depends on the states. And the, and the states are, form a Markov chain. And so what do you have as a parameter? The transition matrix of your Markov chain, Q, and the di emission distributions for the, the, di the conditional distribution of Y given X. And you want to be non-parametric in these emission distributions. And so your parameter is complex because you have Q and a lot of functions to estimate. And so what it turns out that if you can, you can get a bunch of emissions on Q by being totally stupid on F. So you have a very stupid prior on F. You, you model your densities as piecewise constants with a finite number of pieces. But you, you do that, you have a uh, Bernstein from Mises of Q, so a very good posterior distribution on Q. And that's your pi 1, that's your first module that, uh, Paul, uh, that um, Pierre was talking about. You marginalize out, you get a pi 1 of Q given Y, that's super well behaved. But then, of course, you are totally stupid in F, in, on the F, so you want to do something else on the F, and so now you're going to do the second module. You're going to con consider a second prior on F given Q, as if you hadn't had a prior before on F, and now you, you're computing the conditional posterior distribution on f given y and q, and that's your second module, and you multiply the two and you get the cut posteriors. And so that's exactly what uh, Pierre was talking about, and I think that semi-parametric inference might be another venue where you might want to do that. So you don't have two data sets, you have just one data set, but you have two different priors in a sense that you want to combine in a clever way. So my questions in this regard are, can you, decide whether you should do that or not? Like, would, would the base factor be the way to do? Should you do something around uh, prediction? What would be the right way of thinking about it? I don't know. So we did it because asymptotics worked. But maybe there are better reasons. And then my second question is computational, is that, so we did the sort of the naive version, in a sense, we ran the, these mini chains. So, but then you are in a context where you are in an infinite dimensional parameters. So would the um, technique of uh, coupling that you're using to sort of uh, run your MCMC 
How do they scale with these infinite dimensional parameters? What kind of uh, drawbacks do you have when you have in these high dimensional problems? Um, there are open questions for me. Uh, so in conclusion, um, so as you see, so, the, so there, there has been throughout this conference so far a recurrent question of how do you construct an interesting probability on the space of parameters? And uh, Nancy talks about, talked about it in her talk. Uh, there, is this, uh, there was a session on generalized Bayes of gift posteriors. Um, Mike West talked about it. Everybody, so it's a recurrent question. So there is sort of the orthodox base, but obviously not everybody, it's not always possible, and so you might want to do something like that. And this work is another very interesting way of thinking about this problem, I think. Um, it also has this interest of, I'm trying to wonder, to question, I can't remember why I wrote that, but it must be something. So uh, could be, um, could be used to, yeah, so somehow, yeah, so it's also a way to maybe detect departures from, uh, like if you have model misspecification in a sense, so if you do this cut posterior, maybe it's a way to, to, to question parts of your models here and there, and so that might be a nice way to figure out where the misspecification comes from. There is a need for that for, to create good criteria, uh, and that seems that's, uh, so there is a lot of work to be done in the area. I think it's a, it's, it's, this is an exciting area. And I would like to congratulate again the, the work. Thank you. Thank you, Judith, for the thought provoking uh, discussion. The next discussant is Professor James Berger from Duke University. My thanks also to the organizers for allowing me to participate in this Bayari lecture session. Um, I, I'm going to allow myself one uh, Susie story to begin. Uh, Su Susie Bayari, we've heard, was a, was a renowned Bayesian statistician. Uh, she, she was also renowned in certain other areas, uh, amongst them being a wine critic and a food restaurant critic. Indeed, one year, I can't remember which one it was, in Spain, she won the Verema Award, given in the country, for the best restaurant critic. Now, those who had the pleasure to go to dinner with her after she won that award were, you know, were, were, were receiving an amazing experience. Because the restaurant owners, the restaurant chefs, would be hovering around the table, trying to make sure everything was perfect for this critic, and bringing all sorts of special treats out. It was, it was quite wonderful. Uh, so uh, also wonderful was, was Pierre's lecture today. In fact, it was so clear that I, that I was having trouble thinking about uh, uh, what I should do as a discussant. And, and I finally decided that I would just try to reinforce some of the most important points that he raised uh, through um, uh, one particular area that he mentioned of uncertainty quantification, in particular because this was the area in which Susie herself uh, did her seminal work on modularization. So in un uncertainty quantification, there's, there's three elements to it uh, that you have to know. One is a, a simulator, which is a computer model used to construct some real process. For instance, a climate model is used um, to, to try to predict future climate. A surface flow model is used to try to predict volcanic flow. Uh, so that's one big component. Another component is an emulator. And these simulators take off, can take a long time to run. The surface flow models that, that I've, I've worked with and Susie worked with took two hours for a single run on a supercomputer. Climate models run at high resolution takes two weeks to run on a supercomputer. And so if you want to do an MCMC somewhere in the analysis, you do not like two hour iterations or two week iterations. So you have to come up with an emulator, which is a statistical model that you construct to approximate the simulator. And then finally, you put these together with data, and this is the field of uncertainty quantification, the process of relating and combining simulators with data and uncertainty. Now, th th this UQ name is, is given by the engineers and the, and the uh, uh, applied mathematicians. It's kind of anathema to statisticians, because we do, everything we do is uncertainty quantification. But w when I say UQ, I'm referring only to this one specific area. 
Um, it's a huge field. There's, there's thousands of people working in it. There's huge conferences. There's even a, a joint SIAM ASA journal on this field. Now, it's, in, it's inherently a modular field. And um, there's, there's three modules that are kind of always present, and sometimes many, many more modules. The first model is some data. We're, we're interested, I mean, our interest is in reality, like climate in, in 2050. Um, and, we, and, and we're going to have some data available about that, plus uh, some measurement error. So this is just sort of a statistical model. Um, S here is just denoting the initial conditions. So if, if for climate uh, in the future, one of the important things is the amount of carbon forcing we have. So, so carbon forcing would be an, uh, an initial condition or an input uh, to, try to, uh, to try to assess what's going to happen. Um, this error can be arbitrarily complicated. Sigma here is just used generically to, to represent parameters having to do with the, with the error um, in the data. Um, then reality, uh, you have the simulator to also try to estimate reality, uh, but the simulator has some bias to it. Uh, one of the first examples I ever worked on, uh, uh, and this was with Susie, we were presented essentially with this figure where here was what the, st the data said, and here was what the computer model said. Uh, we were asked the, the, the funny question, okay, so can, we, can you validate the computer model? And we, we looked at this picture and said, well, the computer model's up here and the data's down here. It, it's obviously not valid. Um, uh, but any, anyway, th what this means is you have to introduce this bias uh, uh, in, in doing the analysis, and that makes life, life really difficult. Uh, and then theta denotes some unknown simulator parameters like, like um, 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 rate equations and in, in PD, PD, uh, PDEs and stuff like that. Um, and then finally you have a third module, and this is this thing I talked about, is the simulator takes too long to run, so you have to emulate it, and that's going to be done with some errors. And how you do this is you just run the simulator, you run the, you run the climate model or the surface flow model many, many times, as many times as you can, and then from this new data, which is just the simulator runs, you fit um, uh, these runs to, to some functions, uh, co very common is a Gaussian process. And, and then you, this is, introduces other parameters, eta, which are like the, like the co correlation coefficients in the Gaussian process. So, th so there are three mod modules. Um, and so the, the full model uh, can be represented sort of like this. Uh, first of all, off to the side is the simulator runs. Uh, and, and then that's related to the emulator and error. And then you have the original data. Oh, and I, I forgot to, sorry, I think I forgot to say that. Well, let, let me go back. Um, how do we go backwards? There we go. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, forgot, I, I forgot to say we have some, the, 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 this data, I, I, I've kind of adopted Pierre's notation where this data can be thought of as coming in two parts, Y1 and Y2. And so, for instance, in very simple situations, we, we'll have replications of this, and we could form a, a, a sample mean of, of, of the data, and we could form kind of a sample variance of the data, uh, and call the second one Y2 and the first one Y1. And, and the point is, 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 that, is that this Y1 is um, uh, uh, closely related to sigma. And in fact, usually, if we wish, we can estimate sigma only based on Y1. That would be the cutting aspect. So in any case, here's the full model for that Y1 and Y2. It's just lumping everything together. And we could, we could sure enough, go and try to do a MCMC uh, based on, on uh, this whole thing. Um, now, all, almost all of the information about the emulator comes from Y1 star. Uh, it comes from up here. I mean, this is where really everything is. Y1 and Y2 do affect the likelihood through this equation, but this bias thing is so hard to determine that you really just cannot pull out any useful information about the emulator from Y1 and Y2. So it's just natural for a whole bunch of reasons just to, to, to modularize, cut right there, and, and find the emulator only based on Y1 star. Um, 
when you go to stage two, you have a problem that the sigma and the bias are extremely confounded. Uh, I mean, for instance, I could make the data fit the computer model by, by dramatically increasing sigma, or I could uh, put it in the bias. So, the, um, th th so that suggests that we also probably want to modularize, if we can, by using Y1 uh, to find the posterior distribution of sigma. Uh, it, it can also be done by, by use of fat tails um, and, and better, better modeling. Um, and, and in fact, here's, here's a, for one example uh, that, we, that, that we worked on, here, here was one of the, one of the there, was a, there were hundreds of variances involved, and here was, the, here was a trace plots for, for variance number 170. And the top was the MCMC when we tried to operate with the full model. That's not a very satisfactory <laughs> trace plot. And in fact, the variance was, highly, was much bigger than it should be. Uh, down at the bottom was w when we implemented the, implemented the cut posteriors, and it, it was obviously uh, a much better. Uh, and here is where we changed the modeling. It did some more sophisticated modeling. These, these two are actually the same. They're, they're, the the, the, the y-axis is, is different scales. Uh, and then I only have one more slide, because this is, this is just talking about where the, the hard part comes in. So the cut posterior is from the, from the Y1 data, we, we found the posterior for sigma. From the um, running the simulator data, we found the posterior distribution of the emulator and the parameters eta. And then we're left with having to deal with um, the probability distribution of the other data. Well, so here's the likelihood for the other data, given everything. And then there's the prior for theta and the bias um, that, that comes in. And, and so, as Pierre said, the, the simple way to do this, or the, 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 the most direct way to do this, is you just use this distribution to draw a sigma, this distribution to draw an emulator and an eta, uh, then plug them in down here, and then try to get uh, uh, legal draws of theta and the bias from, from the second thing. Um, and then you iterate. Now, now, Pierre nicely sent us his talk a couple weeks ago, and as, and I, and, and, I, and I was reading through it, I, I was going, because I got to the part about um, this common mistake of, of, uh, uh, of just doing this second step like with one metropolis draw or something like that, uh, instead of, and, and Pierre said, you, you, you can't do that, you have to at least iterate that step many, many, many times before you go back and try another step up here. Uh, and, and, then, and, then I, and then I got worried. I went, uh oh, I, I hope we didn't make that mistake. <laughs> and so I went, I, I ran back and looked in the papers, and no, and no we hadn't. In fact, in, fact in, um, uh, in, in, in this, you can't see it, but there's an, a thousand here. So, so what we did is every, we, would do, we would do a draw here and a draw here, uh, and then we'd iterate on that thing a thousand times with whatever scheme we were using. Um, now, now you know, you know, we were deadlines to get this done, so we weren't worrying much about convergence. Did we converge? I don't know. But in any case, you, 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 we were spending every con all of our computational budget on iterating on this second step. And that was even with the modularization making, making the first step easy. Now, the, so the, the one thing I started, to, I got to think about, thinking about with this, and, and this is kind of my question for Pierre, is that he pointed out that if you knew sigma and the emulator, no problem. You just plug it in, and now you're just doing one chain instead of many, many chains. Um, and interestingly, these posteriors are often very tight. This posterior for the emulator, given the simulator repetitions, is, is surprisingly, you, in many scenarios, that's remarkably tight. Uh, and depending on how many replications were done over here, this, this posterior for sigma could be tight. So, so it seems like somehow one should be able to take advantage of that. These are not so tight that I, I would just want to take the posterior mean and plug in, as, as Pierre said you could do. But when you have tight posteriors for P1, it, just, it seems like you should be able to take advantage of that somehow in, in speeding up, 
um, uh, or, or simultaneously doing these, these other things. And so I'm just wondering if, if, if Pierre has any thoughts on that. And that's all, thanks. Thank you, Jim, for another thought-provoking uh, discussion. And Pierre, the floor is yours for a rejoinder. Okay, thanks a lot for the, the discussions. I guess I'll, I'll start with um, comments on, on Jim's uh, discussion because it's, it's so uh, fresh in our, in our minds. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like I have an amazing idea coming up uh, right now in my head, but certainly if the, the theta ones are basically inducing distributions for theta two that are not too different to one another. It seems like the computational effort spent uh, approximating one will be, should be able to be uh, recycled in est estimating the related uh, conditionals. And I guess concrete implementations of that would be, um, for example, via parallel tempering, for example, where you could have uh, different chains for different theta ones that would different two, theta two chains for different theta ones, but they would interact, perhaps they would swap states, for example. You'd have to check that you can, ex, you can compute the acceptance probability. But it, it's an interesting aspect of, of the interplay between the statistical properties of the target and the computational techniques, because for example, if on the other hand, the distribution of theta two was completely different for every single theta one, then there will be no, no hope of recycling anything when going from one theta one to, to the other. Um, I don't know if that addresses a little bit. <laughs> okay. And then on, on Judith's uh, many questions, so there's the aspect on whether the predictive, uh, predictive criterion is really convincing. And indeed, you, you decided to cut for different reasons, right? Because of asymptotics, property in semi-parametric settings, and that's fine. And, and it, in Jim's description of why a cut uh, is natural in, in computer models, there's no need to appeal to predictive performance uh, arguments. Because in, in some cases, it's, it's natural. I think the predictive performance argument is useful to convince someone else who might complain about your modular approach. <laughs> that in fact, because it's a very factual thing to show that uh, you're doing better at prediction, people usually, uh, you know, they have to think a little bit about <laughs> replying to that because that's something that we all use to considering as something valuable. So maybe there's a point there, but it doesn't mean that there's always gonna be the one universal criterion that based on, on, on predictive performance that is always gonna lead us to cutting or not. And then the question on whether you could do couplings of MCMC on infinite dimensional uh, spaces. Um, so reminded me of a, a paper by uh, Agapu, uh, Fulmer, and, and Roberts on, uh, on using like we did the, the glean and re ID of couple chains, but in the context of uh, sampling functions. So it's not it's the same type of infinite dimensional objects exactly, but it, it might be related. And they managed to generate chains that contract towards one another in that setting, uh, with which you can do essentially the same type of unbiased estimation techniques. So there's hope, and also there's some work um, on, on coupling methods for, for example, um, Bayesian non-parametric partition models. So there was a talk yesterday by uh, Brian uh, Trippe who, who um, couples chains defined on the space of partitions. So it's, it's kind of infinite dimensional, I guess, in, not quite, but uh, it's, it's related to non-parametrics, to non right? So, so there is hope, but it, it will be a case-by-case -case, um, problem. So when you have a trace plot like Jim's trace plot that doesn't mix at all, you know that the coupling times will be very long. So you, you must start with a, a well-performing MCMC algorithm, and then the benefits are in terms of parallelism, not having to worry too much about diagnostics, hopefully being able to do very short chains compared to a, a thousand steps, for example. In some cases, coupling happens in a few dozen steps, for example, in a way that would be very hard to diagnose uh, from trace plots. Um, I think the, the very interesting aspects of your work on, on semi-parametric cut posteriors is the fact that it's very much like, in, in a lot of the examples that I've described, the, the motivation for cut comes from the misspecification of the likelihood. And, but for you, it's really about the priors. You really want to use two different priors. And so it's really uh, more interesting, I think, for, for a Bayesian audience, because it's really, you're, you're touching upon something that probably is quite specific to Bayesian semi-parametric inference. Whereas in some other cases, it's 
it's a problem that we have to deal with within the Bayesian framework, but also other people also have to deal with it as, uh, as econometricians know with two-step estimation and so on. So I think that's really f uh, fascinating that now we're, we're starting to get Bayesian-specific uh, questions within this uh, larger modularization question. Maybe I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, you know, beautiful talk on just extraordinary work. Um, you know, the question I had uh, has to do with Y1 and Y2, and this is a little bit like Jim, Jim's example. I can imagine situations where I write down what I would think of as a single model, uh, not modularized necessarily, and yet I could partition the data into a portion or a summary statistic that I really believe and a portion that I don't have quite as much faith in. And I think that your description of really a desire to look at a posterior based only on a portion of the information in the data is, matches that situation as well. Um, wondered if you have any comments on that. No, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I agree that this is uh, uh, at first discomforting because we would like to use, and some people even sort of have to use all the data at their disposal because there's some pressure when, when data takes a lot of energy to collect. You know, to, to use it somehow, but in a sense, you could you use it by choosing not to use it. <laughs> You're considering using it, right? So in a sense, you use it, but uh, but it's it's discomforting. It, but in that case, it really would come from the misspecification. Like the, there are, I think, arguments about if everything was well specified, and there would be no reason to depart. But of course, we know that this is unrealistic. And thanks for the, the question. I had a question about the computation part of your talk. So um, modern automatic differentiation libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow and JAX have what's called a stop gradient operator that allows very much like the diodes that you showed, the ability to give fine-grained control over uh, stopping gradients from passing back through a computation graph. And I wonder you know, if that could be a strategy for revisiting HMC as a method for inference in these, uh, in these cut post areas. That's a great question. Thanks. Um, certainly, it plays a role with optimization-based methods, right? So, for example, with Weichelin inference, for, for, I think, similar reasons uh, as you described, you don't have this normalizing constant, which actually depends on theta one problem, and so Weichelin inference for cuts is very appropriate. And also, we're using normalizing flow. That somehow, all this problem is really when it comes to sampling. And so, with HMC, um, I mean, at least in the vanilla HMC, in the acceptance step, you would still have to compute the, the density of the target, and so it will remain untractable. But maybe you can have an easy time computing the leapfrog trajectories, the, the, the you know the, leap, the approximation of the Hamiltonian trajectories. So, thank you. Thanks. And maybe a last question. Uh, Alex is bringing the microphone. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So. <coughs> um, so when choosing between the cut and uncut distribution uh, using predictive performance, um, <clears throat> I was wondering if we could think that as a diagnostic for some misspecification of part of my model, and beyond that, uh, whether this could give me insights into where the misspecification can come from so that I can then work towards building a better joint model. Thanks, yeah, that's a great question. I, I understand it to be a bit similar to a comment by Judith about whether you can um, somehow diagnose where the problem is in the joint model, uh, where in you that, in that uh, modular setup. Whereas, uh, you know, when we just say the model is misspecified, uh, it's not very constructive. But in this case, maybe looking at the difference between uh, different distributions, updating or not, using certain parts, would certainly be, uh, uh, hopefully in some settings, driving the, the, the model criticism and, and the improvement of the model down the line. Um, I don't know if that probably missed some of your, of your question, but uh, thanks. Okay. So, because of the sake of time, let's thank Pierre and. <laughs>